Uh, thank you, Professor Westervelt. Um, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, so why photonics? Um, I like this uh, this graph. I know this is not a quantum computing graph, but the idea of being able to do information processing using photonics opens up a lot of interesting pathways for efficiency and computational speed. Um, uh, one of my favorites is neuromorphic photonics, um, but uh, quantum photonics is another one. And a big advantage of of um, photonic platforms is there are many degrees of freedom to transmit uh, information uh, and the signals move at the speed of light, which is very, very fast. Um, and also there's not a lot of uh, coupling to the environment. Um, so, so noise is not coupled into the system quite very easily. However, uh, one of the challenges is because noise is not coupled into the system uh, very easily, it's also requires specialized um, structures and optics in order for us to actually manipulate the light to the way we want it. And so uh, these are some interesting um, ways of doing optical computing. Um, but I would like to highlight that uh, really one, one of the big motivations behind doing photonics research is that photonics is, is creeping into a lot of different fields. Um, so you know the free space optical systems, um, everything from super resolution microscopy, optical disk memory, um, chemical sensing, things of that nature. Um, but I think one of the most innovative platforms, of course, is the integrated photo quantum photonics. Um, and of course, integrated microwave photonics, which actually go hand in hand. Um, and so uh, one of the primary motivations is how do we uh, control the light on chip and in free space? Um, so to do that, you have to manipulate lots of degrees of freedom. Um, and in order to structure the light. Uh, I look at the challenge is that we have, we're, we are aware of all these different types of devices in order to manipulate light, um, but we need to make these uh, devices very, very low loss and across a very wide spectrum because, um, you know, you'll see lots of platforms ranging all the way from the, the visible uh, and UV all the way up to the mid IR. And so we're very interested in figuring out how do we manipulate light across a very broad spectrum. Um, so one, one thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is hyperbolic dielectrics um, as a type of material that's good for manipulating light. Um, so what is a hyperbolic material? Um, so you can think of uh, what you see here is your isofrequency curves, right? So these are solutions of, of the different uh, um, light vectors that can couple into the material. And in a dielectric a metamaterial, uh, you end up with a closed surface. Um, in a hyperbolic material, uh, what makes it unique is that the dielectric constant at the operating frequency um, is not, not neither just metallic or, diale um, or dielectric. It is both metallic and dielectric. Um, and so this extreme anisotropy uh, opens up a lot of new um, interesting properties, particularly you get the hyperbolic dispersion. And so if, for example, if two of the three spatial axes show dielectric permittivity and one of the three spatial axes show uh, metallic permittivity, then you get a type one hyperbolic material. Um, if you have two axes that are metallic and one axis that's dielectric, you get a type two uh, hyperbolic material. Um, and the one important thing is, um, people have been able to make metamaterials uh, that kind of uh, emulate these properties here. Um, and so what they do is uh, one very common way of doing that is creating a layers of material. You can see, for example, um, if I were to create layers of a dielectric and, and a metal, uh, in plane, it's gonna behave very dielectric um, um, or metallic, but out of plane, it'll behave just like a dielectric. Um, and so because of that, you create this meta, uh, hyperbolic metamaterial response. Um, same thing they've done with um, uh, metallic pillars, where in the z-axis, it looks like it's a metal, but in the xy-axis, you see mostly dielectric behavior. Um, and so one thing that's that's cool is that um, about hyperbolic materials, and the reason why we like them is the fact that you get this unbound isofrequency surface. Uh, and this is really a key part to the property. So um, your pointing vector is always gonna be tangential to the hyper, hyperbolic isofrequency surface. So S is your pointing vector. And I'm pointing this out because we're gonna talk a lot about K vectors and pointing vectors, okay? Now your K vector um, tells you a lot about the wavelength of the light once it's in or coupled to the material. 
So um, the idea is that the larger the, the K vector you couple to, the smaller the wavelength of the, of the light that's supported. Um, and so one thing that is really interesting about hyperbolic materials is in the very, very large K vector limit, uh, because this is an unbounded surface in an ideal hyperbolic material, the K vector can be quite, quite large. Um, and in that very large K vector limit, your effective um, wavelength of the light coupled into the material is very, very small. So this means you can get extreme volume compression, okay? Um, this volume compression is um, really important, particularly when you're talking about, um, you know, near IR to mid IR, because we want to be able to make these photonic circuits very, very small. We want to be able to make the optics very, very small. Um, and so being able to do extreme volume compression um, is, a, is a very um, important advantage uh, of hyperbolic materials. So in particular, we're interested in polar dielectric hyperbolic materials. Now, why polar dielectrics? Um, well, for starters, the um, infrared has a lot of um, unique applications, right? And I don't want to go into all the different unique applications, but there's a lots of different unique applications. Uh, but one of the, the uh, biggest reason why we like the mid-IR um, is because for polar dielectrics, you create phonon polariton coupling instead of plasma polariton coupling that you typically see in the UV to visible light. Now, we want extreme volume compression. We want to be able to compress that light to something that's a very, very small volume. But we also want the, the, the light to be able to move through the material very, very low loss. These are two very important uh, things. Now, if you uh, think about a plasmon polariton, the plasmon is like the scatter off of everything, right? Um, it's this charged particles. Everyone knows that electrons love to scatter. Um, and so what that does is that creates loss to the plasmon polariton um, um, coupling and also to whenever you create a traveling wave. Now, for a phonon polariton, we are coupling to the phonon resonances, the vibrations of the, um, the uh, lattice itself. And so because of that, it does not couple as easily. Uh, I mean, it does not, I'm sorry, not couple. It does not scatter as easily. And so because of this, you get um, much lower um, losses whenever you couple the light to a phonon polariton. Um, and so uh, Caldwell in 2015, he, uh, he created this really cool graph that kind of looked at all these different materials and created a figure of merit and said, okay, what has the strongest uh, figure of merit for coupling? Um, the idea of being able to strongly couple with the lowest loss. And you can see polar dielectrics in the uh, mid-IR, uh, they win, they, they, they do quite well. Um, and so that's what one of the primary motivations behind looking at polar dielectric hyperbolic materials, low loss with extreme volume compression. Those two things combined make for a great optical platform. Um, so, to study these polar dielectric hyperbolic materials, we uh, we don't have but so many options, okay? We can try to create a, an artificial material, um, but we really want to understand more of the fundamental physics because um, that's not as explored as we would like. And so one uh, material we got really interested in was calcite. Um, the reason why is when you get two hyperbolic bands where it behaves like a type one and a type two hyperbolic material, and that's very interesting. Um, it does, it has strong phonon polariton coupling and it's active in the mid IR. Um, but uh, most importantly, for an experimentalist, um, I can now do my, make my structures and, and study the physics without having to go and make this artificial material and all of the uh, non idealities that come with making this a hyperbolic metamaterial. I can look at a, a naturally occurring uh, material like calcite. So that's what we did. Um, and when we got calcite, it occurred to us something very unique about calcite that we, we should study. Um, so calcite has different crystalline planes, okay? And um, you can see um, in this crystalline plane, if I was to look at its, um, its um, minimum uh, um, lattice, a three-dimensional lattice, you can see uh, in this direction, you get one behavior, and in this direction, you get another dielectric behavior. That's what creates the hyperbolic um, behavior. However, we found is that we really want to study a unique system. We have an opportunity to study a unique system in that, I, mean, I have to grow, scroll back, most systems uh, that you see, 
the uh, what they call the extraordinary axis or the axis that's not like the other two, whether metallic or dielectric, the, the extraordinary axis is almost always out of plane, right? So in plane, you get one uh, behavior and out of plane, you get another behavior. Um, you can see here is an attempt to show um, how you might artificially create um, this behavior in plane, right? But it's very difficult to achieve. Um, but with calcite, because you can get, you can cut it to different crystalline planes, it allows us to cut along the one zero zero axis. And if we cut along the one zero zero axis, we actually get a uh, strong in plane anisotropy, where within one plane, we get a metallic behavior and uh, also a dielectric behavior that's completely um, um, perpendicular to each other. Now, this is a very unique material system. Um, and so it allows us to look at some new physics because, like I said, it's very difficult as experimentalists to create this system. Um, and calcite kind of gives us to us without us having to do anything super fancy just by cutting the calcite. Um, so the first thing we wanted to see is, okay, are there any polarization effects here, right? Um, and when we look at, we want to compare it to the one zero zero one plane, uh, which would be if I cut it in this direction, where I have all my, um, in plane, I have one dielectric behavior and out of plane, I have another. Uh, typically, like, like a typical um, hyperbolic material. And what we found is that we get a strong polarization dependence whenever we look at the, um, the um, in plane anisotropic uh, phase, the, the one zero zero plane versus the zero zero one plane, we essentially get the same polarization um, response, regardless of the angle we change the uh, the incident light, and that kind of makes sense because depending on how we change the incident light, th because it's dielectric in all directions, it's basically going to see the same um, permittivity vectors. However, in the one zero zero plane, depending on how we couple in the light, you're going to get a very very different polarization vector. So you can see this here, right? Um, so we said, okay, well, we should explore this plane and see what type of unique behavior we can create due to the extreme in-plane anisotropy. So that's what we did. Um, we started off by creating resonators. We looked at a 1D uh, grading. Um, and one of the reasons why we looked at the 1D grading is because uh, one, it's easy to fabricate, and two, um, it allowed us to add another uh, degree of freedom to our design in, that is uh, psi. And I'm pointing this out because we're going to talk a lot about psi. Um, and what psi is, is the actual angle of my grading relative to my ordinary and extraordinary axis. So just to kind of put this in perspective, if I were to do a 1D grading in a typical hyperbolic material or in calcite uh, in the 001 plane, where in the spatial X and Y plane, it has the same permittivity, well, then it wouldn't matter what orientation I put my 1D grading. Yeah, I would get the same response. But because we get this strong implant in isotropy, we should get a, 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 a strong, some sort of uh, side dependent behavior, which could lead to some very interesting physics. So we went ahead, we created the, um, the resonator, um, and then we also simulated the resonator. Uh, and these are some of the results we got. So uh, first thing we did was when we measured our, um, our actual sample and we simulated, we noticed this, our redshift here as we increase size. So this is psi equals zero, uh, and this will be psi equals 90, pretty much orienting the uh, 1D grading in the other direction and uh, 90 degrees from, from here. So um, we noticed that one, uh, the measured and simulated results matched up quite well. And we, we went ahead and did a, um, an exhaustive sensitivity analysis just to make sure that we can trust our results. And we found that we can actually trust the results. Um, but this is good because what it allows us to do is look at the simulated data and learn more physics that will be hard to discern from just the empirical data. So from the simulation, um, first thing we notice is that we have a uh, volume confined uh, phonon polaritons. So the ability to support volume confined phonon polaritons is somewhat unique to hyperbolic materials. And um, um, it's very interesting. Uh, we also noticed that 
we couple to an n equals two and e n equals one half mode. Um, and from the n equals two and n equals one half mode, we were actually able to just use in basic geometry, uh, predict what the pointing angle should be. This is all within expectations to an extent. Um, I mean, n equals one half mode is interesting. Okay, that's not very common to see, but it wasn't, you know, particularly uh, interesting. Um, but it does show that the physics holds up whenever you look at psi equals zero degrees. Okay. Then what we did, um, and and then what it also means is that uh, the aspect ratio of our um, resonator does govern the selection rule, and that's very important. Okay. But again, this is using well-known physics um, about hyperbolic materials. Um, and one of that is the ability to, to predict the pointing angle or the angle in which the light couples into the material based on the ratio of its permittivities, okay? But what does that ratio mean as I change psi? Because now what happens is my, if I look at it from the grading, um, I no longer have a purely metallic axis in one direction and a dielectric axis in another. Um, and what we found is that um, we can get a, a, a significant change in the um, actual um, um, resonance as we change size. So just to kind of reiterate, this will be side with zero degrees as the side was 30. And as you can see, I no longer just have a metallic axis anymore. I now have a unique axis uh, relative to my side. Now, uh, first observation we made was that the mode is conserved, meaning that if it's the n equals one half and n equals two modes don't change, okay, as I increase psi. Um, we found that the k vector, or the pointing angle looks to be almost fixed, though you do see a slight shift, and we will address that, um, does look to be fixed as you increase psi. Now, this is very interesting because um, even though my uh, pointing vector doesn't change, the pointing vector seems conserved and the mode seems conserved, the actual resonant frequency shifts quite a bit as I change the grading angle, which to us was a bit perplexing. What how can you keep the same exact K vector and shift the resonant frequency? Um, in the original model, the original physics um, for hyperbolic materials has no way of describing this effect. So we said, okay, this is a, an opportunity to, to, to come across some very novel physics. And so what we did was we realized that you had to consider the K vector as the K vector angle which is determined by my, res my resonator geometry as one of the selection rules. And if you consider that as one of the selection rules, you can actually uh, say, okay, my, my K vector is now fixed to my grading, right? And so because my K vector is fixed in my grading, I have to adjust my resonant frequency in order to keep the same K vector. So K vector is conserved, and yet I'm changing the angle that means that I must change my resonant frequency, my effective resonant frequency, in order for me to keep the same K vector angle. And this created this other equation in here. Uh, and using this other equation, we were able to get the model to fit the simulated results. So this shows that this extra um, part of the physics um, was important for us to figure out the resonance shift. And um, it also said that if I know my pointing, um, vector, if I know my k vector and my pointing angle at psi equals zero, I can use this model to predict what my uh, resonant frequency shift is going to be for all other grading angles as I change my grading. Um, and we believe that this is a general finding. So if you apply, you could apply this to another uh, hyperbolic material with implant and isotropy, and it'll give you the same concept. As long as you plug in your permittivities and you know what my um, my k vector is at psi equals zero, okay? So this was very interesting. Um, and it says that some a lot of this is predictable, right? Because I can predict this psi angle just using geometry at psi equals zero, and then I can use the rest of the physics to predict the rest of the resonant frequencies. So it means that everything is fully predictable. 
Um, and so the other thing we wanted to understand was why is it that we also get a slight shift, right? So we find that even though it looks that the pointing angle is conserved, we find if you look very closely, the pointing angle is not fully conserved as I change side. So we wanted to know what is that discrepancy caused from, right? Um, and so uh, what, you know, what is really the origin of the resonant shift? Um, and so we were able to figure it out. Um, and it took just a little bit of uh, thinking about the hyperbolic dispersion itself. So if we look at this as the ISO frequency uh, uh, surface here, okay? And we say, okay, this is my K vector. And in a typical um, system, uh, this would be as, as expected to see the K vector and the pointing vector to exist all in one plane, right? Both, of course, uh, perpendicular to the gradient. This is something we would expect um, using just the conventional theory, okay? Now, keep in mind this K vector is now is being selected by the grading. Now, the, now as I change this angle, the grading itself does not change. The geometry of the grading doesn't change. So the K vector is conserved. However, because I'm changing the angle of this K vector, right? That implies that I can no longer stay on this isofrequency curve. I must move to a broader isofrequency curve in order to sustain the same K vector. And by doing that, um, that essentially means that I'm going to be coupled to a um, to a, a a a new frequency, and that explains the frequency shift. If the K vector is conserved as I rotate my K vector. I'm going to have to change the isofrequency curve that fits that K vector. That is the cause of the frequency shift. Um, and so that was very interesting. It also gave us a new, uh, uh, a new thing to pay attention to, that my pointing vector is no longer coplanar with my K vector. Now, what does that mean? What, what implications does that have? Because with it, what we expect here is that every all my energy is being pushed directly into my um, my substrate, but as I lose the um, the alignment between my uh, pointing vector and my k vector, that implies that my um, actual my um, wave is no longer pointed going in the same direction, and so. Um, before we kind of just looked at reflectivity as reflectivity in the Z direction. And so what this said was say, we should look at the other um, uh, power flows in the other direction, in the X and Y direction as well. Now we can see very, very uh, see here um, that in the side of my, um, my resonator or my grating, I don't get much power flow. Right. And at psi equals zero, I basically don't get hardly any power flow along the sides. Almost all the power flow is directly into the substrate. However, because I am now coupling my pointing vector, no longer coplanar, I'm adding a new component to my pointing vector that's now in the direction along the grading, in this direction right here. And we can immediately see that in the simulations that if I look at the power flow through this face of my grading, I now go from having no power moving through that phase to a large amount of power moving through that phase. That means that now, just by sh slightly changing the angle of my resonator, I'm, I'm completely changing the direction of my wave. Um, and we can see that as I go to higher and higher psi, I still get my resonant frequency shift, but I'm also now pushing my my pointing vector um, is now being dominated by going into, put into uh, the grading phase. So this was very interesting. This says, okay, we can not only control the resonant frequency using, but using um, a uh, highly anisotropic uh, hyperbolic material. Not only can we control the resonant frequency, but we can also control the direction of power flow. And this immediately says this has application to make a spectrometer, right? So that's the lowest hanging fruit. If I can change the power flow, uh, the direction of power flow and the resonant frequency, that says I can make a spectrometer. 
So in summary, um, we we did a couple different things here. One, um, we got notable volume PHP confinement, vol, uh, phonon polariton confinement. Um, so that's that's good because that's ultimately what we want. We want to be able to strongly couple volume phonon polaritons. We also were able to um, come up with some new physics uh, about modal conservation and uh, the implications of modal conservation when looking at highly in plane high anisotropic hyperbolic materials. And we also noticed that uh, two, two new functionalities, we can control the power flow and we control the resonant frequency. However, this is great from a, for, for writing a paper, but if I actually wanna make a device, we have to make these resonances way deeper. And so what we did was um, the next step is that we're now making uh, resonators with much, much stronger um, resonances. But not only that, now we have the physics needed to actually try to control how our resonant frequency shifts. And so uh, this is some preliminary work. So I apologize if the slides aren't as, aren't as pretty as the others. Um, so first thing we did was we changed the size of the resonators, um, the height of the resonators, made them much smaller. And by doing that, we got a much deeper resonance. So much stronger coupling. This is very good because that means this is the first step for us creating a, a workable um, um, device. The second thing we did is we wanted to look at uh, 2D gratings. So for this 2D grating, we changed the um, psi angle from zero to 90 degrees. And what we found was we didn't get a shift at all. I said, okay, that's, that's, that's a little bit odd. So what creates that shift? We decided to look at another uh, square lattice here. And this time we went to a diameter of two microns and we saw a shift, right? We saw a shift, not with psi, but with diameter. Huh. So we change diameter, we get a significant shift. But when we change psi, we don't. And this made us think about the 1D grading as what if part of what, what changes, part of that, that that um that shift is the fact that you can actually you're actually changing the effective diameter in the metallic direction. We never really considered that. So what we decided to do is look at rectangular uh, gratings. Um, and as and because we had the data from the diameter equals one micron, and we have the data from diameter equals two microns, we wanted to make our rectangular grading one by two microns. And what we found is that by making a, a re rectangular 2D gratings, that's one by two microns. As we change psi from zero to 90 degrees, we get a shift. And we get a shift where the first part of the shift is predicted by two microns, right? And as we rotate the, where the, the short side is now along the metallic axis, we end up shifting to the resonant frequency predicted by one micron. So something about the square resonators themselves actually can predict what the resonant frequencies are gonna be. And the idea of creating a shift, it's all about coupling both into both at the same time. So essentially by creating a rectangle and by rotating that rectangle, uh, rectangular 2D grading, we can create the shift. And likewise, if we start off with one micron in the metallic axis, and we shift to where it's two microns in the metallic axis. So essentially starting with the rectangle facing the other direction, we actually can cause it to go from a blue shift to a red shift. We actually change the direction of the shift. What this means is that we can actually use our physics to not only create much deeper resonances, but to con and to control the specific res um, resonant frequencies, but we can actually control the shift itself and change it from red shift to blue shift. And I have a feeling, depending on the geometry, we might be able to get change from red and blue shift. We might be able to get um, a mode that moves both directions. That remains to be seen. So that's our current work um, pushing um, this research. Um, and the other thing that's very interesting is that um, we did measure and simulate the upper hyperbolic band. And when we did, we found the same interesting Moore's uh, law. I'm not sorry, Moore's law. <laughs> I'm sorry, Malice law uh, dependence. And what we found is that not only we get the same Malice law dependence, which means that 
there's an opportunity to do some of the same similar things, possibly. But we actually are coupling to uh, surface phonon polaritons, which gives an opportunity to actually measure this response using uh, a, a, an SNOM system. And so uh, our future work is not only looking at 2D gratings um, and being able to use that to control our um, resonant frequency and the shifts in that resonant frequency. But we're also looking into uh, surface phonon polaritons by looking at the type two hyperbolic band of calcite. So, um, so far this work has been very fruitful. Um, the first set of data we're currently writing up and plan on publishing very soon. And hopefully we should be uh, finishing up these two uh, works in the coming months um, and then moving forward from there. Uh, possibly looking at another type of material that can show this re show this um, response. So let's see how I'm doing on time. I'm basically out of time. Um, I did want to very briefly go through um, carbon nanotubes seeded growth. So my past work was with carbon nanotubes and, and measuring the properties of carbon nanotubes. Um, I found very interesting things like, for example, 1D electron electron uh, scattering. I mean, one electron electron screening does not fit theory. So there's an opportunity to learn some new physics there. Um, I've always been fascinated by ballistic transport. Um, and then also in 2020, the paper came out and said, hey, we can use carbon nanotubes to create 1D Moray patterns, which will be really important for creating spatially coherent quantum light sources. And I thought, okay, that's insanely cool as well. However, so far, there has not been a direct pathway to actually take the science experiments and make them into full quantum or classical devices. Uh, part of the reason why is because of the chirality dilemma. And without going into it, you get create multiple different types of chirality, and they behave very, very differently. In order for us to use carbon nanotubes, we need to have one single chirality. Um, in the past work, uh, I did some work with John Rogers to do carbon nanotube purification, but this wasn't really scalable. And so what motivated um, my growth research uh, was a group at Duke who had made significant progress uh, cloning nanotubes. And so the idea is I can put down a nanotube seed, grow from that nanotube seed, a, a carbon nanotube that's just like the seed. And they were able to show that after cloning, it maintains its chirality. So this is a pathway in order to achieve a single chirality. However, it's a very low yield process. So this motivated um, uh, a lot of my research and I decided to create my own seeded growth uh, process um, without going into it. This is the process. It doesn't require any metal catalyst. I put down uh, nanotube seeds, uh, six, five nanotube seeds and I regrow them. And the idea is once I regrow them, then I have a nanotube arrays of single chirality, and I can make uh, 1D, 2D Moray patterns, and along with lots of interesting devices. Um, so moral of the story is, I think it worked. I think it worked quite well. Um, we were able to regrow seed, um, nanotubes from seeds. Um, you can see after the air water etch, we were able to etch the nanotube seeds. And after many cycles, we were able to achieve um, very, very large densities, much higher yields than was previously published. So that solves the yield issue. Um, and um, let's see, I mean, our nanotubes, we've gotten areas where uh, up to 3.6, really four nanotubes per micron. Um, we can do this wafer scale. We can do this across a three inch wafer. Um, it's 100% reproducible. Um, we get very long nanotubes, uh, typically over 100 microns. Um, the longest I've seen is we've seen areas where nanotubes were as long as 500 microns. So this implies we have very high quality tubes. Um, the question is, do we have single chirality? And so I wanted to bring this up because whoever's listening, who has any interest in nanotubes or quantum materials, if you have a way, because uh, this is a very challenging measurement to do, if you have a way of measuring chirality of nanotubes, please talk to me and reach out because I have a ton of nanotube samples and I would like to know if I'm actually growing single chirality or not, what the chirality distribution is. And I've had, had challenges doing this with Ramen. Um, there's lots of different uh, advantages to doing this, like getting rid of the, the metal catalyst, um, enabling new quantum platform, um, 
and just all kind of, all pretty much all nanotube applications can be realized um, if we take this high yield process that I had and, and, and make sure that it's single chirality. Um, that kind of gets us very close to the holy grail of carbon nanotubes. So if you're interested in learning more about this, please talk to me. Um, with that said, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, um, particularly Dr. Chase Ellis from the Naval Research Lab, who um, sponsored the calcite research. Um, and thank you for listening. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for your, your talk. A lot of interesting things. Um, let's see, the way that you can ask questions on uh, Zoom is to type your question into the chat or Q&A windows, and then we'll take a look and then read your question uh, uh, and, and answer it. Um, let me start out with uh, Eric, with your, uh, the work with calcite is quite interesting because that's, you know, a very unusual optical material uh, to start with. A uh, push it, it looks like it would make a very good spectrometer because of this angular dependence is very large with a small change in in frequency. Um, what what kind of angles do you see for that and sort of future electronic, I mean, photonics? Um, so definitely spectrometer is one of them. Uh, but the fact that we can control power flow means we're wondering if I, one thing I didn't point out to you, to you guys, and I would like to point this out. Um, I have to go all the way back here. Uh, the, the, this is 1.2 microns, but the op, the operating frequency is around 12 microns. So we're getting a volume confinement of almost 10x. And so one thing we're also interested in is whether or not we can use this to create a very low loss, highly compact infrared mid-infrared waveguides. So spectrometers is one avenue we're looking into, but we're also interested in seeing if we can maybe create a, an, an optical antenna to launch the polariton and then use this as waveguides to direct the, the polariton with incredibly strong volume confinement. Um, and that of course being, wouldn't be possible if we weren't able to figure out that at the zero degrees, we're never gonna get propagation, but just by changing the angle, we can get significant propagation and power flow through the um, grading. And so that that says this gives us a clue as to how to actually create these waveguides. Yeah, interesting. Um, any question? Well, let me, let me ask you another question too. With the way that you do lithography, can you make more exotic looking patterns that is not straight lines, but picture pictures of the Mona Lisa or something like that or more? Yes, uh, yes. So we're basically using a fib to do this. Um, calcite is okay. quite hard. It's not easy to etch. Uh, so we're using a fib to do this. With that said, we are interested in exploring some other types of resonator geometries um, other than the 1D and 2D grading. Um, we're also interested in seeing if we can emulate this in some of the three fives um, because that would then allow us to do some more semiconductor etching and make it more fab uh, compatible. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks very much. Any last time to type in your questions? Do you have any? Okay, if not, uh, thanks again. It looks like we have one raised hand. Oh, okay, go ahead. Am I right? We got one raised hand. Are you gonna click it yourself and take a look? Uh, I'm not out sure. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I'll speak up. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think we can. Oh, I guess the connection's not working, but you, know. you can also type in uh, in the chat and then we can read it if you like. This is my email. You can go here to find my email in case you want to talk more. Um, oh. And also my, my email is eric.cbron at howard.edu. Great. Okay, well, well, thanks very much. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. <laughs>